Well, let's go ahead and pray, and then we're going to jump right in, all right? We'll just get started. Let's pray. Our Father, I want to thank you for your precious word, how desperately in these days we, we need to be grounded, grounded in the scriptures, grounded in your word to us, because in it is eternal life, in it is the forgiveness of our sin and all of our guilt, in your word is, is, the, is the information that we can have a relationship with you through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the most important thing in this life that we could ever do is to make sure that our names are written in the book of life. And it's nothing we do to get it in there. It's, it's all what you've done at the cross. And it's a gift that you give to us when we receive it by faith. May that be so clear. And I do trust and pray that every single person that is in this room tonight knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that they belong to you, that they have a relationship with you through your son Jesus. And now as we jump into this book of Genesis, it is a vitally important book of the Bible. Everything in the Bible comes out of Genesis and everything in the New Testament goes back to Genesis. Many of the struggles in our world today, in our country, as we talk about all these issues of homosexuality and transgender and all this stuff, and marriage issues and all kinds of things, all of it goes back to the book of Genesis. And we realize that as sinners, we're in rebellion against you, and how we need to understand and believe and stand upon your word no matter what. So I pray that you'd help us and help me to teach. And I pray that this would be a helpful study as we, uh, as we get grounded in this foundational book. And I ask this, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'm going to try this year to keep my notes to one page. Okay. One page, front and back, that's going to be it. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to get through it, but uh, it does mean I'm going to try to keep it to that because it gets a little long when you get four pages going there. All right, let's begin with the, this thought of, I got a question for you all, everyone. What is, what is your worldview? Every person has one. Every person has a worldview. What is yours? You say, well, what, what do you mean by a worldview? Well, a person's worldview is simply the sum total of one's beliefs about the world. The big picture, okay, the big picture that directs our daily decisions and actions. Everyone has a worldview. Even atheists have a worldview. Everyone has a worldview. And it's, it directs, it's the big picture. It's what gives your life meaning or no meaning. It's what gives your life direction or no direction. You just live by your passions and lusts and you just do what you want to do. There's, no, there's chaos everywhere because you have no center, no foundation. Everyone has a worldview. It's the big picture that directs our daily decisions and actions. And, you know, it's worldview, that sounds so philosophical, doesn't it? The term sounds like some abstract or philosophical thing, a topic discussed only by pipe-smoking, tweed-jacketed professors in academic settings. But it's not so. It's very practical. All right, well, how you answer... Three basic questions determines your worldview. I mean, if you sit down with someone and ask them three basic questions, explain this to me, here they are. The first question is this, where did you, where did we come from? Okay, where did we come from? Do you believe that you, four to five billion years ago, some non-living chemical spontaneously 
generated life and you crawled out, your ancestors crawled out from underneath a rock and through a long process of evolution, you just accidentally evolved and here you are today. Or do you believe there's a God who created man? That's a big difference. And it has all kinds of implications for how we live, um, and, and everything. It has huge implications. So, so the question is, um, where did you come from? Who are you? Where did we come from? Who are we as human beings? Are we accidents? Are we the result of time and chance? What, a, what, a, what an empty and hollow... I can't imagine thinking that. But a lot of people do. So where did we come from? Who are we? The second question is, what has gone wrong with the world? What do you, the mess that the world is in, all, the, all that you see in this world over the decades and over the centuries and millennium of when you read history and all the mess, the death, the disease, the, the murder, the, the way men have treated men and men have treated women and just the chaos in our culture and in other cultures, evil in the world, the question is, what has gone wrong with the world? How do you answer that question? And then thirdly, what are we going to do or what can we do to fix it? What can we do to throw more money at it? More education? What can we do to fix it? Every worldview view can be analyzed by the way it answers these three questions. They form a grid, a grid, a template that we can use to break down the inner logic of every belief system and philosophy that we encounter. You know, from the textbooks in our classrooms to the unspoken philosophy that shapes the message we hear on Oprah. I don't even, she, she's not even around anymore. I don't know who's around. Who, is the peop, who, is the, who are the people that people listen to now? You have some names for me? I don't know who they are. Huh? Dr. Phil? Dr. Phil? Who else? That guides people's lives? Yeah, the Kardashians? You know, I mean, whatever, whatever. They're, they're speaking philosophy. Whether they call it that or not. People listen to them. They're guided by them. They wear what they wear. You know, I'm just saying, it's a grid. Worldview. Where did we come from? Who we are? are we? What has gone wrong with the world? What can we do to fix it? That determines your worldview, how you answer those questions. Okay. Well, secondly, understanding worldviews is extremely important. It's extremely important because point A, it explains why people behave the way they do. Look at this, um, uh, this next uh, picture up there. Worldview explains why people behave the way they do. Notice on that slide there that people's attitudes and actions spring from their value system and their value system is based on what they believe. People's actions are just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. That's what you see. That's what you see. But below that surface, there's values and it's, they're based on beliefs. So, understanding worldviews are extremely important. It explains why people behave the way they believe. And unless their actions, unless their Worldview are built on the solid foundation of biblical beliefs because God the Creator has given us His Word. Unless they're built upon that, you can expect their lives to reflect the pain and consequences of wrong choices. And even when we as believers go through difficult times and horrible things in this world, whether it's disease or whether it's in our families and, and whatever. Whatever comes our way, we know that we're to do what? Trust in the Lord, right, with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. 
In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. We have the Lord. We know that all things do work together for good to those that love God. So we can trust the Lord, right? We understand why evil is in the world, why disease is in the world. This is not our home, this world, is it? No, it's not our home. We, the best days for the believer are yet to come. So we have a center. We have a foundation. And that we know the Lord loves us. He, did not, he who did not spare his own son, how will he also along with him give us everything else? In other words, we can trust our Lord because he will see us through. And he doesn't allow anything to come that he will not help us and guide us. Remember, we're not in heaven yet, right? We're not, we're not there yet, all right? So this is really important, you know. And by the way, worldview not only explains why people behave the way they do, but point B, it explains what's happening in America today. It explains what's happening in America today. Simply put, what is happening in our country that that wasn't there 30 years ago or 40 years ago or 100 years ago or even maybe 20 years ago. What is happening in our culture? I'll tell you what's happening. There's a clash of worldviews. It's a clash of worldviews. There are two worldviews that are clashing, vying for prominence, and, the, and simply put, conflicting worldviews are clashing, and the conflicting worldviews are two, one and two. Here they are on your notes. You can fill in. It's naturalism versus theism. Naturalism versus theism. Okay, what are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about this. Look, what is naturalism? Well, the foundation and the basis of naturalism is Right here, the mind of man, human reason. Forget God. God doesn't exist. It's, we can do it. We'll pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. It's our mind. It's our thinking. That's naturalism. Naturalism is the belief that natural causes alone are sufficient to explain everything that exists. Natural cause, naturalism, is sufficient alone. God is not needed. Natural selection, time and chance, naturalism of the forces of nature are, are sufficient alone, time and chance, to explain everything that exists. That's naturalism. That's the foundation. And the result is, the result of naturalism is relativism, okay? That's the fill-in. No absolute values. There's no God to be accountable to. Um, uh, there's, everything's relative. You have your truth. I have my truth. We're supposed to respect each other's truth, except if it's biblical um, and grounded in moral absolute. Then you don't respect that. But, you know, everyone, it's relative. Truth or not, you have, you have your, your truth, I have my truth. You know, if, as long as we leave each other alone, we're fine. That's naturalism. And then the other one, the other conflicting view is theism. The foundation of basis of theism is the word of God. Divine revelation, God has re spoken to us. He's revealed his will in his word. The 66 books of the Bible from Genesis through Revelation, the Word of God is the foundation. And the idea is this. Theism is the belief that there is a transcendent God. In other words, he's above the universe, above all creation, because he, he made it. He predates it into eternity past. But it's the belief that there is a transcendent God who existed before the world existed and who is the ultimate origin of everything else. The universe is dependent at every moment on his providential governance and care. He holds it all together, too. 
And the result of this is absolute values. There is truth and there is error, right? There's truth. God sets what truth is. And it doesn't change. It doesn't move. It means we have, if we're theists, we have a core foundation. And no matter what happens in our life, we, we, we are grounded on that core foundation. And um, we, know that, uh, we know that the best is yet to come. So that's what's happening in our country. It's, it's, we used to be a country that was grounded upon Judeo-Christian values, right? And they're still out there. There's still, they're still they're some of, there's a semblance of, it, semblance of it still there. But it is gradually crumbling. The, the values, the Judeo-Jewish-Christian values of the Ten Commandments, of moral absolutes, of the fact that there is a God that have guided homes and our culture and our Congress in the past. There was this sense, even though people weren't believers, there was this Judeo-Christian foundation and heritage that permeated our society, but that is, being, that is crumbling. It's coming apart. And there are two worldviews that are clashing. And it's sad to see, but it is happening in our country. And it's happening rapidly. Rapidly. So we need to understand that. And these two worldviews are utterly, completely opposed to one another. They're completely opposed to one another. Um, all right. Now let me just say number three. Let's go to number three there. When, when we think about this, and oh, by the way, wait, let me put up some, some of these things here. Uh, let's see. Let me go to eight. There's the Christian worldview. We look at everything through uh, this lens here. This comes from, you know, you know where this comes from, Answers in Genesis. How many have ever been to the Creation Museum and the Ark? Okay, if you haven't been there, I encourage you to go. It'll, and make sure you go when you have time to read everything, okay? <laughs> because, man, we went years ago, and we went with our little kids, when, and uh, we might as well not. We were just chasing them down, you know, trying, so they didn't get lost in the crowd. And we got home and said, what did, man, what a whirlwind. You got to go when you can read. But there's the, there's the his, history of the Bible, the seven seas of history from Genesis Genesis 1 and 2, ending up Revelation 21 and 22. But, you know, you, there's different worldviews. There's this one, where we look at the world through the lens of Scripture. And then there's this one, where those that don't believe in God look at the world, and they see... Billions of years, millions of years, billions of years, death, bloodshed, suffering, disease, and they, it's all naturalism. It's all, uh, it's just time and chance, time and chance. We're an accident. That's how it began, and there's no reason, rhyme or reason. There's no future. You die, you just become part of the dirt again. There's no future. There's no meaning. There's no purpose except to live Get all you can get out of this life, no matter what you have to do to get it, and live for yourself, live for pleasure, be number one. If you're not getting it, then go somewhere else to get it, and it's all about you. Because you only have one life, you might as well grab all, the, all that you can get out of it. That's the other worldview. And, and the results of it are, are rather sad as well. For example, you know, here's some other diagrams of this. Looking at the world, that's secular history. Although looking at the same world through God's word, through a biblical lens, which is the truth. And there's the two worldviews right there. 
there's the two worldviews. And they're clashing in our country big time right now. And then here's the, here's, um, oh, that's not the one I wanted. Just a minute. I have to work through these because, yeah. There's the results of these things. If we come out of naturalism, the mind of man is the foundation. It's what we think. We don't need God. We don't need revelation. We, we just, we're just dependent on what people think. The mind of man has produced an explanation for the universe and this world and all of life, and that's called evolution. And it results in all kinds of things, and that is the worship of the earth, naturalism in the new age, secularism, uh, Marxism, anarchy, relative... I'm trying to read these things. Relative standards. Everything's relative. Uh, abortion. Euthanasia. Homosexuality. Promiscuity. Um, just name what we're facing. All of that comes out of naturalism. However, if the word of God is our foundation... And then the, the word of God teaches divine creation, that there is a God, a personal God. He created us in his image. And um, something seriously went wrong with man's rebellion against God. And the whole earth and the universe is under a curse. But God has done something about that to redeem us, to save us, so that he can have a relationship with us again. And as a result of that, we that come out of that, we have care for the creation, um, good science, government under God, right and wrong, the value of human life, we respect it, family values. All of these things come out of that, that foundation. Here's another one. You can look at it this way. Coming out of God's word is the belief in creation, in law, the idea of laws, marriage, one man, one woman for one lifetime, standards, there's right, there's wrong, meaning in life, the meaning of life, out of man's opinion, lawlessness, School violence, homosexual behavior, pornography, abortion, murder, rape, uh, all these things, chaos in marriage, living together, all of this. Confusion concerning gender. Um, just, just chaos. Because, I mean, who can say what's right? So, what? Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, who can say what's right? So this is what we're talking about here. Now, you say, why did you say all that stuff? Well, I said all that stuff because, number three, the basis for the Christian worldview is God's revelation in Scripture. No other book of the Bible. Well, before I get to that, let me, let me just say is the Scriptures. Of the six, and of the 66 books that make up the Bible... The book of Genesis is probably the most important book ever written. Why? Because the Bible is actually a compilation of many books written in, by 40 different men over a period of 1,500 years, and the book of Revelation is the foundation of them all. Everything goes back to Genesis. That's why we need to understand Genesis. And that's why I'm glad we can do that. I trust you'll stick with us as we move through this great book of the Bible because it is the foundation and we need to understand it. Okay, let, let me just give you a few A, B, and C under number three. No, no other book of the Bible is quoted as copiously, that means in large quantities, in an expansive and wide-ranging way throughout the rest of the Bible. It's 
No other book of the Bible is quoted as copiously or referred to so frequently in other books of the Bible as is Genesis. I don't know if you knew that or not. But that's true. Listen to some of these things. Adam, the first man, is mentioned by name in the books of Deuteronomy, Job, and 1 Chronicles. Noah is mentioned in 1 Chronicles, Isaiah, and Ezekiel. Abraham is mentioned by name in 15 books of the Old Testament and 11 of the New Testament. Jacob is named tw in 20 books of the Old Testament other than Genesis and 17 times in the New Testament. In a special sense, every mention of the people or nation of Israel is an implicit acknowledgement of the foundational authority of the book of Genesis. Since Israel was the new name given to Jacob, and his sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. Apart from the book of Genesis, there is no explanation for Israel, nor consequently for all the rest of the Old Testament or the New. And here's another point, right under point A there. The New Testament, the NT, that's why I got a short space there. The NT is, if anything, even more dependent on Genesis than the Old Testament even more dependent. And I've got all kinds of statistics. Just listen to them. There are at least 165 passages in Genesis that are either directly quoted or clearly referred to in the New Testament. It is significant that the portion of Genesis which has been the object, I don't know if you knew this or not, but the portion of Genesis that has been the object of the greatest attacks of skepticism and unbelief the first 11 chapters is the portion, portion which had the greatest influence on the New Testament. There are over 100 quotations or direct references to Genesis 1 through 11 in the New Testament. Furthermore, every one of these 11 chapters is alluded to somewhere in the New Testament, and every one of the New Testament authors refers somewhere in his writings to Genesis 1 through 11. On at least six different occasions, Jesus himself quoted from or referred to something or someone in these 11 chapters, including specific reference to each of the first seven chapters in the book of Genesis. I know I'm overwhelming you with, with details. One more, okay? Furthermore, in not one of these many instances where the Old Testament or New Testament refers to Genesis. Now listen to this. Is there the slightest evidence that the writers regarded the events or personages, the people, as mere myths or allegories? Stories. To the contrary, they view Genesis as absolutely historical, true, and authoritative over their lives. That's going to be an important point. So, what's my point? Well, well let me get to... Yeah, Genesis is foundational. It is quite impossible for one to reject the historicity and divine authority of the book of Genesis without undermining, in effect, and in effect repudiating the authority of the entire Bible. If we do not know and believe what God tells us in the book of Genesis... The rest of the Bible has been undermined of its authority over our lives. And that's why throughout history, the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis has been the, has been the target of skeptics and critics because what do they go after? The foundation. Because if that foundation can't be trusted, then... The rest of it can't either, because everything goes back to Genesis. So, we must oppose any effort from any source to mythologize or allegorize the Genesis record. It was written as sober history, the divinely inspired account of the origin of all things. Where did we come from? Why is there evil in the world? Why do bad things happen? You know, it all. What has God done about it? All of that is very clear. Point number B, the book of Genesis gives vital information 
concerning the origin of all things and therefore the meaning of all things which would otherwise be forever inaccessible to man. Now, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to go through some of these things. Are you ready? There's, a lot, there's quite a number of them, and I don't have them listed there. But I said the book of Genesis gives vital information concerning the origin of all things. I mean, have you ever thought, why are you wearing clothes? Animals don't wear clothes. There's a reason, and the reason goes back to Genesis. Whether you know it or not, whether the atheist knows it or not. Do you ever think about why, why are there seven days in a week and in every culture everywhere and throughout dec decades, centuries, and millennium, there's seven-day week? Why is there a seven-day week? There's a reason for that. What about the origin of the universe? Stars, galaxies, the Bible explains that. What about the origin of order and complexity in the world we see? Whether it's a study of the human eye, the, the intricacies of the ear, of the throat, of the human body, of this world, of its precision. Man's universal observation, both in his personal experience and in his formal study of physical and biological systems, is that orderly and complex things, listen to this now, tend naturally to decay into disorder and simplicity. Everything breaks down. This is called the second law of thermodynamics. Order and complexity never arise spontaneously. Never. Never. That is a scientific fact, a real scientific fact. It's not just scientific consensus. It's a fact. Complexity and order do not arise spontaneously. The universal observation both in personal experience and in his formal study of physical and biological systems, is that orderly and complex things tend naturally to decay into disorder and simplicity. What about the origin of the solar system, sun, moon, and planets? What about the origin of the atmosphere and hydrosphere? The earth is uniquely equipped with a great body of liquid water, an extensive blanket of an oxygen-nitrogen gaseous mixture, both of which are necessary for life. These have never developed on other planets and are accounted for only by special creation. Origin of life. How living systems could have come into being from non-living chemicals is and will undoubtedly continue to be a total mystery to evolutionists, no matter what you've been taught or heard. It's a total mystery. The marvels of the reproductive process and the almost infinite complexity program, programmed into the genetic systems of plants and animals are inexplicable except by special creation. The account of creation of living creatures in Genesis is the only rational explanation. What about the origin of man? Man is the most highly organized and complex entity in the universe, possessing not only innumerable intricate physio and chemical structures and the marvelous capacities of life and reproduction, but also a nature which contemplates abstract entities of beauty and love and worship and which is capable of philosophizing about its own meaning. Man's imaginary evolutionary descent from animal ancestors is altogether an illusion. The true record of his origin is given only in Genesis. We're created in the image of our creator. What about the origin of marriage? The remarkably universal and stable institution of marriage and the home in a monogamous, patriarchal social culture is likewise described in Genesis 
as having been ordained by the Creator. Polygamy, infanticide, matriarchy, promiscuity, divorce, abortion, sodomy, and all other corruptions all developed later as part of the fall and man's rebellion against God. What about the origin of evil? The origin of physical and moral evils in the universe is explained in Genesis as a temporary intrusion into God's perfect world. Allowed by him as a concession to the principle of human freedom and responsibility and also to manifest himself as redeemer as well as creator. You know, it says in Ephesians chapter 2, he says God raised us up with Christ, right? That in the ages to come, that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus There's going to be many people that are going to be with the Lord in the new heaven and new earth. Right? People that are saved. People that have their names in the book of life. And God is saving them. And he's made provision through his son, Jesus Christ. And everyone is in a savable position, but must make a decision. What about the origin of language, the gulf between the chatterings of animals and the intelligent, abstract, symbolic communication systems of man is completely unbridgeable by an un evolutionary process. Completely unbridgeable. The book of Genesis is not only, only accounts for the origin of language in general, but also for the various national languages in particular. Remember the Tower of Babel. The origin of government. I'm just going to read, just go over these. The origin of culture, the origin of nations. Where did all the people groups and nations of the world, not political entities, but different people groups with different dialects, where did all that come from? Genesis chapters 10 and 11. The origin of religion itself, the origin of sacrifice. Do you know that cultures all over the world in the rem remotest places of, of that, that exist in the world, sacrifice chickens, goats to the gods? Where did that all come from? When these people don't have any contact with anyone else. What about the origin of the chosen people? What about the enigma of the Israelites? The unique nation that was without a homeland for 1900 years, which gave to the world the Bible and the knowledge of the true God through which came Christianity and which yet rejects Christianity. A nation, nation which has contributed significantly to the betterment of the world. What about the cho God's chosen people? God chose Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to be the means of blessing to all the peoples of the earth. How do you explain that they're still going on, right? It's an amazing thing. Now let me talk about something, and there's so many other things. Everything goes back to Genesis. Okay, let me, let's go now to, so my point number C is, my point is Genesis is foundational. I like this statement by J. Sidlow Baxter in his book, Explore the Bible. Let me see if I've got it here. Oh, no, I know I had it. What did I do with it? I'm sorry. Oh, rats. I know I put it in there. Well, it's not in there. Okay. Let me just uh, read it to you. He says, besides being introductory, Genesis is explanatory. The other writings of the Bible are inseparably bound up with it in as much as it gives us the origin and initial explanation of everything that follows. The major themes of Scripture may be compared to great rivers ever deepening and broadening as they flow. And it is true to say that all these rivers have their rise in the watershed of Genesis. Or to use an equally appropriate figure, as the massive trunk and widespread branches of the oak are in the acorn. So by implication and anticipation, all scripture is in Genesis. 
Here we have in germ all that is later developed. It has truly been said the roots of all subsequent revelation are planted deep in Genesis, and whoever would truly comprehend that revelation must begin here. That's what we're doing. So I'm trying to set up this is really important. Okay, let's talk about the some of the let's talk about some things here about Genesis. We're in Genesis chapter one, okay? We're going to start into this in the next week or two, really get into these things. But I want to talk first about the literary structure. What is the one of the major, the major literary structure of the book of Genesis? How it's put together by Moses. By Moses. And that is what we call the Toledoth formula. You say, what in the world? That's a Hebrew word, but it appears 13 times in the book of Genesis. And I'll show you how the book of Genesis is laid out. It's translated, these are the generations of, or this is the account of. But it's best understood in the sense of, this is what happened to. This is what happened to. The repeated use of the Toledoth formula is the most significant structural element in the book of Genesis. There are 13 occurrences of that word in Genesis. And the book of Genesis has a prologue followed by 10 episodes. Okay? A prologue, the account of creation in chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 3. That's the end of the prologue. Followed by 10 Episodes, ten chapters, as it were. The person named is in the beginning of each episode is not necessarily the main character, but is the beginning point of the section, and it also closes with the death of that person. This device accordingly provides a sense of unity to the book of Genesis. Unity. All right, so if you go to your back page there, you'll see, the, the, um, you'll see how this is laid out. So creation doesn't have any, any that, that word. It just chapters 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 3, is the account of creation. And we're going to be getting into that very shortly. But then... For example, look at chapter 2 in verse 4. Let's work our way through some of these. 2 verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they, when they were created. This is the story of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In other words, in Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 2 verse 3, we have the big picture of creation, the seven days. Six days, and then God ceased. He stopped on the seventh day. Then beginning in chapter 2, verse 4, this is the story of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And he gets, gets into more details about the Garden of Eden, about the first man formed from the dust of the earth, about the woman formed from the side of the man, the first marriage. Um, then the fall of man and the, and the results of that. This is the story of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Then we come to chapter 5. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. This is the written account of Adam's line. This is the written account of the story of Adam. Of his line. And in chapter 5, we have, the geneal we have a genealogy. And it takes us down to the time of Noah. But that's the second episode. And it goes into chapter 6, verse 8. Then look at the third one, the third episode. The Toledoth of Noah, chapter 6, verse 9. This is the story of Noah. And then, you know, you, you can follow these through. You come to chapter 10 in verse 1. Let's go there, and we'll stop with this one. We could, we could trace through all of these. 
in chapter 10, verse 1, this is the account, the Toledoth, this is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. So this is the story of these three boys, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the, their descendants. So right on through the book of Genesis, we have ten chapters or ten episodes that are laid out. And they go to show the unity of the book of Genesis. That it was written by Moses and there's a unity to it. There's a structure to it. Because people that go to some seminaries and there, there, there's a theory called the documentary hypothesis, the JEPD theory. It's all over the place and it basically undermines the whole book of Genesis. And people that come, up, come to go through a seminary or a university and they study these things, their, their faith is totally destroyed in the rest of the Bible. What, what I'm trying to say is this word, toledoth, and how it's used throughout the book of Genesis gives unity, gives, gives um, unity the, to the fact that Moses wrote it. And it's one book. It's the most important literary device. So just something to keep in mind. We're not going to do much with it. Let's look now at the outline of the book of Genesis. Okay, let's get into the outline of the book that we're going to follow. And I'd like to put up here a very important statement by Dr. Ken Hanna, where he says, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are a prologue to the call of Abraham and the institution of God's covenant program with Israel. The first 11 chapters are a prologue to the call of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. In other words, everything there guides us to the call of Abraham and the institution of God's covenant program, the covenant God made with Abraham, which shapes all of the rest of the Bible. And, and then the last 39 chapters describe the implementation of God's covenant program through Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and so forth. That's what we're going to really focus on as we go through. Okay, notice the, first of all, the first 11 chapters. We can divide the book of Genesis then into two sections. There's the, what, what word do I have there? Do I call it the creation era or do I call it the primeval era? Okay, primeval, that sounds weird. Um, it sounds like, you know, evil. No, that's not what primeval means. Primeval means the earliest ages in the history of the world. The earliest ages. The Bible does not teach deep time and old, old, old earth. I'm talking about what evolutionists talk about, like 15 billion years, 4 to 5 billion years, which, by the way, they have no idea about. They have absolute, that's the truth. They cannot, that is not, they cannot prove that scientifically. They have their theory. Because they try, to in, they try to explain the universe and the world without God. So they come up with this that is now consensus. But it's not scientific fact, although they may call it that. It's a theory. The point I'm saying is this, the making is this, that the Bible teaches a young earth. You know, most young earth creationists that take the word of God seriously place the age of the earth anywhere from 6,000 to 10 or 12,000 years old. You say, well, man, that's old. Not, not in the evolutionary scheme of things. It's quite young. Because genealogies are given. People look at those genealogies a a little bit different, we'll get into that, but, but if you're a young earth creationist, which, which the Bible teaches, it's anywhere from four to, I mean six to uh, uh, 
10 or 12,000 years. I mean, we don't know exactly either. Because the Bible's not given to help us to know that, to date the age of the earth. It's not given that way. But from what is given in it, we can, we can, we can estimate within that range. So, the primeval, the earliest ages in the history of the world. We, we know pretty sure, we know almost to the year that Abraham was born in 2166 B.C. 2166 before Christ. That, at that time. But the primeval era deals with everything before Abraham creation of the world, um, creation, the corruption that took place in Genesis 3, what we call the fall and the curse of sin that has come upon all of the earth because man's rebellion against what God said and revealed. The catastrophe, the great global flood that, that came upon this world in God's judgment. And because of that flood, the world, the world before that time perished. It's been, it, it doesn't exist anymore. It was deluged and destroyed. And then confusion, what happened at the Tower of Babel that spread people out and from which various people groups and ethnicities and nations grew. So the first 11 chapters has to do with the primeval era, the earliest ages in the history of the world. And by the way, there's only 11 chapters given to it. So here are, the, here are the A, B, C, and D. I already gave them to you. Point A is creation. The heavens and the earth and man created in the image of God. Do you know that every time you look at a human being, a, every time, man or woman, every time you look at a human being, you can understand something about God the creator from looking at them. Man has intelligence. We can grow. We can learn. We can pass on what we learn to other people in books and writing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Man is intelligent. Create the creator is into God is intelligent, right? Infinitely. We have affections, emotions, love, jealousy. Um, you know, we, we have affections, we feel, we have a will, we can, we can change the direction of our lives, we can choose to do this today, or do this, or build this, or tear this down, or build this city, or, you know, we can, we, we have the ability of intellect, of affections, of will to determine our destiny and the destiny of our country and the destiny of the future. Dogs can't do that. A dog is a dog. A dog was a dog 2,000 years ago. And it's still a dog. They haven't built anything. They haven't done anything. Except they're a dog. I'm not, I'm not, an elephant is an elephant. They don't improve themselves. They don't learn. They don't pass it on to the next generation so they can make things better. No. The fact human beings are made in the image of God and God is infinitely wise, right? And uh, we're made in his image. So creation is important. Chapters 1 and 2. Point B is the fall. Sin entered the world. And that is probably the most devastating thing that has ever happened since the beginning of creation is that event right there. Because every one of us lives every day with it, right? Life is hard. Life is sad. I mean, we live every day with under the weight of the curse. Sin entered the world. And, and there it is right there. We know that the whole creation groans and travails. 
in pain together until now. Or this picture right here of the story of the Bible. God's creation, man's rebellion, and what it brought upon this were the curse of sin and the intrusion of death and disease and pain and suffering, suffering and emotional anguish. And we deal with this with ourselves, with other people that we care about and love. We watch it on the news, the chaos and, the, and, and this broken world. What God did, God became man. Our creator became man. And where it, where it is all going is this world is going to be restored to the conditions of Genesis 1 and 2. And only those who are saved, whose names are in the book of life, are going to be part of it. What we do with God's salvation, whether we receive it or reject it. So this is important. We have the flood Point C is the flood, the judgment, God's judgment for sin. The, the world became so bad uh, that God stepped in and all but eight people came through on the ark. It was a global flood. And then point D, the Tower of Babel, the beginning of the nations. And I don't mean only political entities. I mean ethnic, ethnicities people that, and their own little cultures, wherever they are, and their own dialect and languages, ethnicities. Those are the nations. Well, after we get through the primeval era in the first 11 chapters, which are very important to understand, we come now to the patriarch area, era, the era of the patriarchs, and that's chapter 12 through 50. There are four major men in the patriarch era. Here they are, A, Abraham, that's chapters 12 through 23, basically. He's the father of the promise God gave, an unconditional covenant God made with Abraham. God chose him, elected him, and he, and he, and he made promises to Abraham that are unconditional. It didn't depend on Abraham or his descendants. They're unconditional promises that through you, this is going to happen. We'll get into that. Very important to understand. If you want to understand the Bible... Abraham, 2166 to 1991 B.C. He lived to be 175 years. Isaac, 2066 to 18, 1886 B.C., 180 years. He's the second father of promise. Abraham had Ishmael and Isaac. And Isaac, it was through Isaac that, and uh, Sarah, right, that uh, God's promise would go. Not Ishmael. And that creates a problem, doesn't it? By the way, it's a problem to this day. And then Jacob is the third patriarch. 2006 to 1859 B.C., 147 years of age. He's the father of the Israelites. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. He had 12 sons. They are the 12 tribes of Israel, the children of Israel. And then Joseph, um, 1915 to 1805 B.C., 110 years, he became the leader in Egypt. God sent him there. And that's, by the way, the story of Joseph is a great story, isn't it? It's, it, it the story of Joseph illustrates Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those that love him. That doesn't mean everything is good. But Joseph could look back on his life and say, you meant it for evil, what you boys, what you brothers of mine did to me. You meant it for evil, but what? God meant it for good. To bring us to this point, to the saving of many lives. It's a great story of Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He's at work. 
and he will make your path clear. He'll direct your path. So we'll get into the Genesis record. Is it reliable? And um, then we'll, we'll jump right into chapter 1. So I, ho was, I hope that wasn't too much uh, detail, but um, I think that we, we need to deal with the foundation a little bit. So I'm looking forward to the study. I trust you'll stay with us. Let's pray. Our Father, I want to thank you for this uh, amazing book of the Bible. I just love the book of Genesis, and I pray that everyone will grow in a deeper understanding and love for this book and see that you have revealed it, and there's so much here that we need to understand it. It's the, it gives us the center, the core, the foundation of everything and the rest of your word, and we need to, we need to understand it and respect it. So be with everyone as we go our separate ways tonight. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name, amen.